joy that only you can bring that is overflowing from each one of us. In the name of Jesus, we bind the enemy. There is no room for you here. But come, Holy Spirit, inhabit this place. God, we pray that as we look to you today, that you would just inhabit the praises of your people. That as we lift up praise from our hearts, you would come and settle among us in a way that we can see and know and feel. We pray for a freshness of who you are this Christmas season. I just ask you to keep our, our eyes on you, Father. We worship you, for you are worthy. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Before we sing this next song, I wanted to share a scripture that I read this morning with you. I was reading in John chapter 11. That's the story of Lazarus, when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And I wanted to point out something that stood out to me that had never stood out before. After Jesus meets Martha, you know, Lazarus is dead. And remember, he's stinky at this point. That's what Mary tells him. He stinks because he's been there for so long. Um, Martha meets him, and then Martha runs ahead and tells Mary and goes and finds Mary. And she says, the master is here, and he's calling you. And the very next verse, it says, Mary quickly got up and ran to meet the Lord. You know, Mary was mad. I don't know if you know this, but what she said to the Lord was, Where have you been? Lazarus died. And she could have sat there and pouted and been like, I'm not meeting him anywhere. But she went. And this morning as I was reading that, I just felt like that's what God is saying to us. The Holy Spirit is coming and he's whispering in your ears, The Master is here. And he wants to meet with you. And so as we sing this next song, it's a familiar Christmas song. Will you tell the Lord that you're available today? Will you run to him and be present? Come, Lord.
her daughter and son-in-law, the Schaefers, and they are going to light our Advent candles for this week. Today we light four candles. The first is the candle of hope, reminding us that we have hope that one day God will make all things right. The second is the candle of love, helping us remember to love others as God loves us. The third is the candle of joy, reminding us of good news that we give and receive joy would we generously share with others. And the fourth candle is a candle of peace. Peace sometimes seems hard to find, but that's why we work at being peacemakers. We want to show the world that Jesus is the Prince of Peace by the way that we live. Today we remember that Jesus wants to bring us peace that we can share with others. Let's pray. Dear God, we're so thankful that you didn't run away from the hard parts of our lives, but that you love us enough to be with us through all of it. Help us to find peace, even in the mess, and then help us to find ways to share our peace with others so that they may know his peace also. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. concept of peace. And it's because Jesus is our Prince of Peace that we can make declarations like, I am not alone. And we can know that even when we walk through darkness, even when we're in the valley, He said He'd never leave us. Amen? He said He'd never forsake us. And so we want to invite you to stand again and we're going to sing this song together and it just be our, our declaration of hope today.
before him in prayer this morning, we can rest in that truth, in that reality, in that hope. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for reminding us again and again that we are not alone. That you will not leave us, you will not forsake us. You are with us, you are for us. In the best times, and in the times of growth and difficulty and challenge. We're not alone in those moments. The enemy wants us to think that. Wants to steal our hope, wants to steal our joy. But Jesus, we remember today that you are our Prince of Peace. You are our refuge. You redeem us, you restore our joy. Lord, restore it right now. Fill us with hope. Fill us with your peace. Lord, fill us with your love. Father, help us to see things through the perspective that you want us to see things. Lord, guide us and direct us. Lord, men, anything that is breaking inside of us, be our great physician. Lord, we need your miraculous healing touch. Not only in our bodies, but in our relationships. In how we see things and how we think about things. Lord, help us to hear your voice in new and exciting and clear, crystal clear ways. Lord, help us to have a laser-like focus on you today. Jesus, continue to be in every relationship that we have. We know we're entering into a time when we're going to be with family. And Lord, there could be unresolved conflicts in our families. Lord, help this to be the year where reconciliation happens. Lord, help forgiveness to happen. Lord, let it start with us. Let us remember your forgiveness for us and let that flow through our lives. So Lord, be with our broken, messy world. Be in this country, Lord. Bring unity that wraps itself around our faith and belief in Jesus. Break through the differences between the political parties and help us just to be so driven to love you, God, with every part of who we are and to love each other. Lord, heal. Heal our divisions in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we are about to give an offering, Father, we pray that you would do miraculous things through this offering, that we would give it with joy, and that you would help more people than we can count come to a saving relationship with you. Lord, touch every generation that's represented in our church and in our community. We want to see lives changed, transformed in Jesus' name. Lord, we just pray that you bless this offering now. In your precious and powerful name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. We're going to take a look at what's happening in the life of of our church.
Today, from noon to three, in the gym, the teens will be wrapping presents here at the church as a fundraiser for our 2020 Work and Witness trip. Bring all your presents to be wrapped and let them get the job done for you. Joy to the world! The style of night! Oh, come, all ye faithful! I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Did you know that there's over 20 Christmas carols in our hymnal? And we're going to sing them all tonight, 6 o'clock, in the fireside room, as we tell the story of Christmas. Don't miss it. On Christmas Eve at 6 p.m., we will be having our candlelit and communion service. This is always a spirit-filled, blessed service focusing on the hope of Christmas. Nursery care will be provided, so bring the whole family and worship for the Lord King with us. Can you believe that 2020 is almost here? Just like last year, we are incredibly passionate about kicking the new year off with a season of corporate fasting. Fasting is a biblical spiritual discipline that often goes overlooked. But when we fast together, we unlock realms of God's kingdom that would not be accessed otherwise. So we want to invite you, start praying now. How would God have you fast with us in the new year? We are planning this year to do a 40-day fast. We will kick that off together on January 5th and end it on February 13th. Maybe it's food you're going to fast, a partial fast, or a full fast. Maybe it's social media or some other form of entertainment. See God and let Him tell you exactly what He's asking of you in this season. But let's bind together in the name of the Lord and seek Him for the new year. If anyone has any special prayer needs this morning, our prayer team will be available at the front of the sanctuary following service. They would be thrilled to pray with you before you leave. We're switching things up again this week before Pastor Andy comes forward to bring us message four of our Advent series. We want to give you a bit of time to say good morning to the people around you. So you have just a few minutes. Shake somebody's hand. Give them a hug. Tell them you're happy to see them. We're so glad you're spending your Sunday morning with us at Newport Mass.
When I was a teacher, that's what we used to have to do to try to get the class's attention. Yeah, well that is always fun when we get the chance to connect together on Sunday morning. Here comes heaven. It is exciting. We are celebrating our attention today on the birth of Jesus. And we'll have a blessed time together Tuesday night at 6 p.m. for our Christmas Eve service as well. Today we're talking about mercy in the mess. And we're going to look at a passage out of Matthew that paints a picture for us that's a little bit different than Luke's account of preparation for the birth of Jesus. We get to see a raw, real look into what Joseph and Mary were dealing with in their culture, in their lives, and it helps us to understand how we are not alone in the difficulties and challenges we face today. You know, it's sometimes like this in, a, in this part of the year when we're just so busy, when there's so much happening, that it can seem like whatever difficulties we're facing, it's just magnified. And we can feel like we're in the midst of something that there's no end to. We don't know how we're going to get through it. Jesus is here for us. His help is holy. And he has everything we need. And we're going to look at God's word together today. And it's packed with truth that is fresh and so meaningful and blessed and beneficial for each and every one of us today. You know, I love just how impactful God's Word is. And it reminds me of a pastor who was doing some home visitations. And he had had a long day of visiting people in his church and in his community. And he went up to the last house he was going to do a visit at. It was one of those situations where he knocked on the door... And he could tell that someone was home, but they didn't come up and answer the door. He could tell someone was there, he could hear someone inside, but they didn't come to the door. So he took out his business card, and on it he wrote a biblical reference, just to give a nice note to the person that was home, but chose not to come to the door. So he wrote Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, and he just stuck it in the door. And he left. Well, a week went by, and they had had church, and the offering was collected, and the team that he has that counts up the offering every week, they noticed that the pastor's business card was in the offering plate. And somebody had written another verse on it under Revelation 3.20. Somebody wrote Genesis 3.10. And they thought the pastor needed to see this. So they gave it to the pastor, and he remembered this card, of course, he remembered writing Revelation 3.20, which says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But he needed to look up Genesis 3.10 just to know for sure what it said. And after he read it, he just laughed. Because Genesis 3.10 says, I heard your voice in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. <laughs> didn't come to the door. I think the pastor appreciated that. You know, God's word, it declares truth. It's light transforming truth. And today we're going to look at a very, what we would view and what I'm sure they viewed at the time could be viewed as a messy situation for Joseph and Mary. What we're looking at today is when Joseph finds out that the woman he is engaged to be married to, Mary, an engagement was very different in their culture, in their time, he finds out that his soon-to-be bride was a virgin named Mary, was already with child. We don't know if Joseph found this out through a very tear-filled, anxious Mary, we don't know if that's how Joseph found out or if he found out through the rumor mill of his day. But we know that Joseph finds out. And as Joseph finds out, he has some choices. In that day and time, as some of you may know, but some of you might not know, engagement was very different. 
You were already under a contract for your relationship when you were engaged. Even though you weren't living together, even though you weren't being together physically, it was a very serious matter. Their commitment was deep. And for that to be broken off at this point, <coughs> Joseph, <coughs> finding out that Mary was pregnant, could have brought her to trial. And if he would have brought her to trial, if it would be proven that she had been unfaithful, or if something horrific had been done to her against her will, then he could have ended the relationship and his reputation could have been salvaged. You know, Mary could have explained over and over again that the child that was within her wasn't from another man. She could have explained over and over again how an angel had come to her and that that angel described how the Holy Spirit would make her into this state of blessing, of being able to carry God's Son. She could have explained that over and over again. But Joseph, he understood how things worked. He wasn't delusional. But yet we learn a lot about Joseph and his character in the midst of the verses we're going to be reading today. This situation, looking at it from the outside in, it does look messy. And it would have been very difficult for Joseph to process all of this. And it reminds us that Jesus came into a messy and chaotic world to move ordinary people to do extraordinary things. We've been saying, here comes heaven. And that hopefully brings comfort into our hearts and minds because some of us, maybe many of us, are in the midst of our own messy situations where we're lacking hope, maybe where we're afraid, maybe where we're just depressed and discouraged. Know today that Jesus has all of the hope, all of the peace, all of the love that we need today. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me in honor of reading God's Word as I read Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And this is, of course, if you're able to stand. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place... <coughs> While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and didn't want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. May God add his blessing to his word as we study together. You may be seated. As we break this down today, I want to encourage you. So many people are in the midst of messes right now. Messes that are out of their control. Messes that may be occurring because of poor decisions or struggles they face for their entire lives. People need the hope and love of Jesus now. I want to encourage you to share that love with them. Invite them to church. Share what Jesus has done in your life. 
You can follow along in your notes today. Maybe you have your paper notes out, or maybe you're using our church app, and you can use the digital notes that are in there. This is the first part for your notes. Enjoy miraculous mercy. Enjoy miraculous mercy. That's a challenge for us. We can receive it, and we need to receive the Lord's mercy. Sometimes there's walls up around our hearts and minds that the enemy chooses to use and tries to get us off track from what the Lord would want to do in and through our lives because of shame, because of our guilt and regret. Even though we've been forgiven, we've been redeemed, we need to enjoy Jesus' miraculous mercy. But we can also be people that love people and give the Lord's mercy to others. Because of the mercy he's given to us. That's part of enjoying it. You know, it's great at Christmas time, I guess, to receive gifts. Some of us just love receiving gifts. But I think for many of us, we've grown to understand that the greatest gift of all is giving. Seeing that joy, seeing that love given is such a blessing. Enjoy miraculous mercy. I want to just focus on verse 19 in Matthew 1, verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. When he found out that his soon-to-be wife Mary was pregnant, he had some choices. There were some logistical things going on here that Joseph had to choose and think about. As I already shared with you, he could have demanded that she be brought to trial. He would have had to promise a certain amount of money to Mary's parents in order to marry her. You know, that reminded me that when I was going to ask for my lovely wife's hand in marriage, I went to her parents' house. And I wanted to ask her father for his permission to marry his daughter. And I brought him roses for her mom and chocolates from Cincinnati, Ohio. They only make these in Ohio. <laughs> Esther Price chocolate candies. And I brought them to share for her dad. And really, hopefully now I look at it, I was just trying to bribe them. <laughs> it's sad. But they bought it, thankfully. But in Mary and Joseph's day and time, Joseph had to promise a good amount of money to be engaged to Mary. And if he could prove that she had been unfaithful, then he wouldn't have to pay that money to be married to her. That could have been a factor for him. His reputation was also at stake. You know, our reputations matter so much to us today, but they also mattered greatly then. A poor reputation impact your business, impact your status in the community, impact your ability to do different things. Joseph and Mary having a child before they were officially married would have impacted both of their reputations. Joseph could have looked at this, and if he could have proved that Mary was unfaithful, that the child wasn't his, he could have saved his reputation and still upheld the contract of their engagement. Despite great risk to himself, Joseph chose a path of love and mercy for Mary. This is what would be best for Mary, not for himself. A quiet divorce would, wouldn't prevent rumors, but it would give Mary a chance to live at home with her parents. Her life would not be easy, but she would be alive. If she had been proven guilty in a trial, per the law of their time, they would have brought her out in front of the community and she would have been stoned to death. They took the law of God so seriously during that day and time. Joseph clearly had love for Mary. The Word of God also tells us that Joseph was a righteous man. The word righteous is often described as doing the right things for the right reasons. And that is what we see in Joseph. 
in this passage. Joseph showed mercy in the midst of a very messy situation. But God would show mercy to them both, as we're about to continue to look at here. Because he came to Joseph with an opportunity to change his mind. To go God's way instead of what he thought was the right thing to do. And in doing that, he wouldn't miss out on the greatest adventure of his life. So often, God's will, God's guidance for our lives takes us right into messy situations. But when we obey him, we find this amazing blessing of not being alone because he is with us through even the messiest of situations. He can take those broken, fractured ordeals and make them so, so beautiful. I don't know what kind of messy situation you're in right now. But I want to encourage you to embrace the Lord's mercy for your life and to extend mercy to the people in your lives with the Holy Spirit's help. This is also in your notes. Be available for divine appointments. You know, our availability today is so challenging. Last night someone shouted out, I want to be available in our service last night. And we want to be available. I want to be available for the Lord to speak to me through His Word, in my quiet times of prayer, through other people. But I think in today's world it's very challenging for us to be available. You might think, well, why is that? We've been looking at it a little bit over the last couple of weeks, and we're going to look at it a little bit further today. It's so much easier for us to be distracted. But we see that Joseph was available. Verses 20 through 23 of Matthew 1. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, read this with me, God is with us. got to resonate with us today. In the midst of the mess, an angel of God shows up. In the midst of Joseph trying to process through what he should do, God's message comes to Joseph. Joseph's mind was made up, but then a message from the angel comes, and it is a divine appointment, and it could change his mind. I need you to hear this today. God's truth and His call on your life is greater than your fears and your desire to run. His truth and His call on your life is so much more powerful. Joseph discovered this. The angel tells Joseph that the child would be named Jesus, which means Yahweh saves God heard the cries of his people, and he is coming to save them, just like he saves us today. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. I'm thankful for his saving power. Are you thankful for that today? Yes, I'm so thankful for that. The angel tells him that he's to name him Jesus. I found that interesting. Joseph naming this child that wouldn't be his biological son. Joseph naming this child in this day and time, in this culture, would declare that Joseph is claiming Jesus as his own child. This was binding. This was an official adoption. In the midst of the mess, God shows up. The angel shares another name for Jesus, Emmanuel, which, as we said, means God with us. Jesus is God with us. Jesus 
The Lord was entering into their present world, into humanity, in the midst of the messes that existed in their day and time. And he's with us in the midst of our messes today. You know, it was a difficult time politically and personally to be alive. It was a very challenging time that Jesus was entering into. The Romans had so much control over everything. They were cruelly in power. They taxed the Jewish people horrifically. The Roman soldiers walked the streets doing anything and everything they wanted. And their actions were so often unfair and abusive. The Jewish people couldn't build or travel without permission from their government. In any case, it was also a very challenging time to sur survive. Injuries could cause infection and death so easily. So many women died from childbirth. Poverty was high, and to make a living wage, you had to do backbreaking <coughs> work. It was a very messy time in the lives of the people. God came into this mess bringing hope, love, and joy. Freedom and victory. And it's just a snapshot because times have changed a little bit, but when we look at things globally, the world we live in today is an incredible mess. But Jesus is alive. And he's got hope for us. He's got freedom for us. He's got so much victory. And he wants to meet us still in these divine appointments. But we have to be available. And this is a question I've been asking myself all week. How available are we for divine appointments today? You might say, well, Pastor, I'm here. I could be sleeping right now. I could be watching those 10 a.m. football games. Some of you might say I'm here, but I'm checking the score on my phone right now. <laughs> How available are we for divine appointments today? This is something God's challenged me on. As you heard Pastor Jenny share, we are getting ready for a fast. <clears throat> and this last, well, this year we're finishing. The fast we did at the start of 2019 in January was life-changing for me, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do in 2020. But the Lord's been checking me on my availability. I came across a survey this week. A survey from Microsoft found that 77% of young adults answered yes when asked this question. Microsoft did this survey, and they found that 77% of young adults answered yes when they were asked this question. When nothing is occupying my attention, the first thing I do is reach for my phone. I think it's interesting that they did the survey with young adults. I think that's now across the generations. I mean, whenever you're in a group of people, that's what we see. You know, when people are in their cars at the drive-thru at Starbucks or wherever they're in the drive-thru at Death Bros or wherever, and we're waiting there, we got our phones out. When you're at the grocery store and people are waiting to check out. You know where we used to look at the horrible tabloid magazines? <laughs> or at the things that we really don't need, but they're right there staring at us saying, you need five different types of gun. <laughs> or your fingernails are getting kind of long. It's time to get some clippers. <laughs> now we're on our phones. Well, we could be engaging with people and talking to people. I know the introverts are like, nope. Nope. That sounds like the worst thing I could ever possibly do. That's why I use the click list and just pull up and take a load up my groceries and I'm out of there. But we're so disconnected from people from those quiet moments, from those opportunities. This new normal of hurried digital distraction is stealing our ability to be here. To be present. I've been reading a book by pastor and author John Mark Comer. That's where I'm getting some of this research from. And in this book, I found this quote that I want to share with you. I think it'll be up on the screen. He said this, The noise of the modern world 
makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the one input we most need. We can be more available to have divine appointments with the Lord. To hear God's message for our lives. This is something the Lord is helping me to iron out for 2020. You know, I've always felt like to be a good pastor, I need to have my phone with me all the time. I need to be available all the time for those emergencies, for those texts, for, you know, hopefully I can figure out the algorithm on Facebook to find out if somebody needs something because they're posting something. It's harder and harder to do that all the time. The Lord's been checking me on that and challenging me to consider being more disconnected from my phone. The Lord reminded me that there was a day and time not too long ago when we didn't have cell phones. I know that's shocking to even think about. It's hard to even imagine that reality. We're sure that's not some kind of made up concept. Now there was a day and time where if we wanted to get in touch with people, we had to go see them. Connect with them in different ways. I don't know how the Lord's going to challenge you to be more available, but I know He's working on me. This is also in your notes. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. That's where we find Joseph here. He's, he's had this idea that he's going to divorce Mary quietly, which felt like a great act of mercy and love and compassion to save her from being punished publicly. And then he has this divine appointment. You know, if he'd been watching Netflix all night, I don't know if his mind would have been ready to hear from the Lord in those moments. But now he has an opportunity to make a choice. Verses 24 through 25. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Sometimes we read this and we might just pass over and think, well, Joseph had to say yes. No, he didn't. He didn't have to say yes. But he did. And every day the Lord gives us direction, discernment, and choices. He's not going to force us to do what he's calling us to do, what he's leading us to do. But we have this example. Joseph said yes. There would be rumors. Mary and Joseph were righteous, but there would be some in the community that would judge them. People haven't changed. People are always looking at each other. They would have known that Mary was pregnant before their marriage was official. Their reputations would change. And having any child is a life-changing experience. But Joseph had to prepare to be the father for the Savior of the world. But he still said yes. He chose to follow God even if it meant what he could view as running right into a mess. You know, we can come up with so many different excuses and reasons to not obey God, this call in our lives. But let me tell you this. Every time we let the excuses win and the rationalizations win, we sin by not obeying the Lord. And we miss out on the adventure God has for us. Let me tell you, there's been so many times where God has called me and challenged me to do something that is in His will, but every part of my being is frightened by it. And I can come up with a whole list of reasons not to do it. <laughs> but when I've been obedient, I look back and think, Lord, that was such an amazing adventure. I'm so thankful I said yes. Because we are not alone. Amen. He is with us. He is for us. He has our back. We need to be doers of the word. James 1, 22 and verse 25 says this. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Verse 25. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Let's not miss out on the amazing opportunities God has for us. This week I came across kind of a historical thing. 
about some companies that missed out on some awesome opportunities. How many of you remember Blockbuster Video? Oh, I can remember those Friday nights when I'd be going with my parents, or as I got older, to drive with my friends to Blockbuster, and we'd walk down those aisles and try to find that new release movie that we wanted to watch, and I always tried to know the tricks. And if there wasn't a movie at the wall, I'd go to the front desk and see if somebody just returned that movie I was looking for. <laughs> if it was in that return box, it was like I had just won a great victory. <laughs> That was one of my favorite traditions of the family getting pizza on Friday night and watching a movie from Blockbuster. At their peak in 2004, Blockbuster had 60,000 employees, 9,000 stores worldwide, and annual revenues of $5.9 billion. At the time, only 4% of homes in America had a broadband internet connection. But in 2010, everything changed. That number of people that had a broadband, high-speed internet connection in their home in 2010 rose to 68%. In other words, the game changed, and now the game was video streaming. Blockbuster eventually filed for bankruptcy, but it didn't have to be that way. They actually had an opportunity to buy a DVD mailing company named Netflix for $50 million in the year 2000. <laughs> that might seem like a steep price, but that $50 million at that time represented three days of Blockbuster's revenues. Netflix is now valued at $32.9 billion, which is more than the value of CBS. And now there's only one blockbuster left in the entire world. And it's in Bend, Oregon. <laughs> kind of interesting. Blockbuster missed an opportunity, but they're not alone. You know, Yahoo turned down an opportunity to acquire Google. And Friendster turned down a chance to buy Facebook. These are some big misses. Joseph could have missed out on an amazing adventure time of being a parent for Jesus. I'll say it right now. We miss out in huge ways every time we disobey God's calling and His will for our lives. We have to choose wisely. I want to apply this to our lives and give us some challenges today. I'm going to invite our worship team to come up and we're going to finish our service of worship again. And as we're getting ready, I'm just going to give you these. This world is a messy place. People are hurting today. Right now, many of us might be hurting. There's countless addictions, tragedies, sickness. God is still with us in the mess. Because of Jesus, we can go from the extraordinary, or from the ordinary, to the extraordinary. Or if you're already in the extraordinary, to even a greater extraordinary. I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray for us here in a moment. But I want to encourage you as we sing this first song. If you're in the midst of a mess right now that you feel is overwhelming, is daunting, as we sing this song, I'm going to encourage you to come forward to the altar and just surrender your mess at Jesus' feet. He can handle it. He's greater than your mess. Last night I had the privilege of praying with somebody who was in the midst of a horrific mess. Maybe today that's what you know you need to do. Maybe you need His mercy. But let's close our eyes and bow our heads as we get ready to pray. With our eyes closed and our heads lowered. If you just know you need his mercy today, you just raise your hands so I can pray for you. I see those hands. I see them all over the room. It's just so humbling to say, I need you, Jesus. I need your mercy. You can put your hands down. He sees them and he knows it. Before we pray, if you're a person that Kind of like Joseph, 
felt led to give mercy, to give that love, I'm just going to encourage you to do something bold. Because we need to be game changers. We need to be Christ's hands and feet in people's lives. If you want to be an agent of Jesus' mercy and just love people in audacious and powerful ways with Christ's mercy, I just want to encourage you to stand where you're at. To say, I'm going to stand as an agent of mercy for Jesus. Look around this room, people. We can, we can change this world for Jesus. He can do it through us. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in the mess, for giving us your mercy, and for calling us to be people of mercy. Lord, help us to just let your love grow, flow through our lives. Lord, we trust you and we love you. Jesus, help us to be available for the divine appointments that you have for us. Whatever that means, whatever we need to change, whatever we need to remove to have those distractions out of our lives, Lord, help us to be ready and available. Lord, help us to just say yes to you. Help us to choose wisely, Lord. We love you and we will praise you. Help us to surrender our messes to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to spend some time worshiping this morning. Remember, if, if we can't be bold inside these four walls, we'll never be bold outside. And so maybe you need to come and kneel in his presence today and just surrender once again. Worship him. Let's lift our voices to
a shout of praise in this place. We gotta go out with a big one, but can I share a prayer request with you guys really quick? I mean this because I have to tell you something that was said about you guys, which is really cool. So we had visitors a few weeks ago, and they were so moved in the presence of God here. And you know what they said to me? They said, it was the weirdest thing. They said, you had all generations worshiping in unity. Amen? That is an outsider recognizing a move of God among us. And next weekend, Mark and I will be at my home church, and I'm preaching, and which is a miracle in and of itself. But they asked me to do Holy Roar. So I'm just saying, something's going to break loose. And so uh, I'm just asking genuinely, we'll be leading worship and then going to try to do the seven words of praise in one sermon. It's going to be really awesome. But will you just pray that God will do something big in their midst? That they would find freedom just like we have here. Amen. So let's sing about the great things God's going to do. Amen? Amen. All right.
this holiday. We love you. Have a great week.